At the southeastern tip of Asia, a narrow strip of land separates the Indian Ocean from the Pacific. This is the Malay Peninsula. At Singapore, some of the world's busiest shipping lanes cross. Here also lie rich tin mines and rubber plantations, two raw materials of greatest importance in war and peace. The southern tip of the Malay Peninsula lies only 80 miles from the equator. In this equatorial zone, the climate is intensely warm and humid with very little seasonal change and an almost daily rainfall. Nearly 80% of the land area is covered with a moist, dense and impenetrable tropical rainforest. Malaya's 8 million people, therefore, live on only 20% of the land area. Though much of this tropical forest is a barrier to transportation, some excellent roads run north and south through the country. Only a few steps from the paved highway, the tropical forest becomes so dense that even the brilliant equatorial sun cannot easily penetrate it. Today, some of this forest has been cleared and put to commercial use. Less than a hundred years ago, rubber trees were brought to Malaya from Brazil. In this short period of time, Malaya has become one of the world's leading producers of rubber. Many rubber estates are owned by English firms because until recently, Malaya was governed by England. These are Tamil women from southern India. Since each of the thousands of trees must be tended daily, rubber estates imported workers from neighboring overpopulated countries such as India. Each morning, the women receive their instructions from the manager, who is also Indian. Armed with buckets, they set out to their assigned sections of the forest of rubber trees. Often they must walk long distances to reach that part of the estate in which they will work. The rubber tapper carefully scrapes the bark of each tree. It takes considerable skill to tap a rubber tree. If cut too deeply, the tree could be damaged and its yield reduced. By removing a thin slice of bark, the rubber sap, or latex as it is called, is made to flow along the downward cut. From the thick white liquid latex, crude rubber will be made. Out of each cut in the bark, the tree will drip for several hours into the collecting cup. The latex from many trees is collected shortly after noon each day. It takes strength to carry this thick and heavy liquid for a mile or more. In the afternoon, tappers from all sides begin to return to collecting stations, which are scattered throughout the estate. At the collecting shed, the pails are weighed in front of an inspector. He takes a sample of latex from each pail to test it for purity to make sure that the tappers have not diluted the sap. When the measuring instrument floats this high in the liquid, the inspector knows that the latex is pure. Weights are recorded and each worker is paid according to the amount of latex she has delivered. Many of these women are children and grandchildren of rubber workers who immigrated from India when the rubber boom started. On some estates, the latex is treated chemically and turned into sheets of crude rubber. This large estate prefers to ship its latex by rail to a processing plant further south. The manager of a rubber estate is responsible for securing the highest possible yield from his trees. He has been trained to recognize when a tree is old enough to be tapped and when too old to be worth tapping. He protects the trees from disease and inspects the planting of new groves. For this, the company provides him with a good house and a good income. He speaks Indian as well as English and is expected to know some Malay and Chinese. While rubber is Malaya's most important export, it also has some of the world's best tin mines. Whenever he finds some free time from duties on the rubber estate, the manager drives over to the nearby tin mine 
to visit his brother who directs the operations here. This large tin mine is owned by an international corporation and administered by this young Indian who was trained in England. This is known as an open cast tin mine because the ore is dug from the surface of the ground. Through the many years that the mine has been producing, the shovels have dug deeper and deeper, digging themselves into this enormous pit. Modern machinery, imported usually from Great Britain, and the most up-to-date mining methods are used in Malaya. This conveyor carries the ore-bearing earth out of the pit. It runs a distance of nearly two miles. The miners here work in four-hour shifts because of the extreme heat. Three shifts load ore 12 hours a day. Thousands of tons can be transported daily by this efficient method of mining. But the giant shovels are capable of digging more earth than the conveyor can carry away. And so a small mining railroad carries even more of the tin-bearing earth out of the mine. The mining cars are pulled up the steep incline by means of a chain which is attached to a winch at the other end. At the top of the hill is the processing station which separates the metallic tin ore from clay, earth and other impurities. In these huge beaters, water is mixed with the earth. The metallic tin ore is much heavier than the impurities and it won't dissolve in water. Therefore, the tin ore sinks to the bottom of the beater while the other impurities are washed away. This muddy water will be used again and is returned to the reservoir through these long sluices. Great quantities of water are required in the processing of tin ore and it is provided by Malaya's heavy rainfall. Again and again, the earth is mixed with water. Each step removes more and more impurities. Gradually, the water becomes cleaner, as only the metallic grains of pure tin ore remain. There are two large smelters in Malaya. At the smelter, the ore is further refined. Ships carry the heavy sacks filled with ore from the mines up country to the docks of the smelter on the island of Paula Brani. Tin ore is heavy. Each bag weighs over a hundred pounds. The ore is extremely valuable since tons of earth must be processed to fill just one sack. In the smelter, the tin ore is made pure or refined by a process of melting. After several days, the furnace is opened or tapped. The molten tin runs out into a bed of sand molds which have been prepared to receive it and where the metal will harden. The resulting ingots are over 99% pure tin. But tin is never used in pure form. It is mixed with other metals by many different processes and is invaluable in the manufacture of alloys which the industrial world needs, all the way from bronze bearings for ships and trains to the coating in the familiar tin can. Malaya exports a third of the world's supply of tin, the rest coming mainly from South America. The growing demand for this precious metal makes Malaya a strategically important nation.